Greetings and welcome, or welcome back. This is the Legacy Bible Podcast, where you will hear lessons from the Bible, taught by our pastor, the Reverend Chuck Greens of the Fellowship Bible Church in Joliet, Illinois. I'm your host, Marcus Onate, and I'll be bringing you more from the Church's Tape Archive. This one we have today happens to be from uh, January 9th, 1992. And it's titled, Endurance in Faith, Persevering Through Trials with God's Promises. So that sounds like a good one. I think that's the only way you could persevere through trials, is if you had the promises of God. Otherwise, else, how would you persevere through them? I don't know. <laughs> guess we'll find out. I haven't uh, had a chance to listen to this one yet, unless I'm putting it together from my uh, for the podcast episode today. Originally, I copied it from tape, from cassette onto an MP3, so I heard it then, but that was, uh, well, months ago. So I guess I'm going to be listening to it again. So I'm kind of anxious to hear it. So let's get right to it then. All right, Pastor Rains, turn it over to you. Would you open your Bibles to Hebrews, please? Chapter 10. Book of Hebrews, chapter 10. Let's look at a section together from verse 32 to the end of the chapter. Hebrews 10. Very, very meaty book. As a young Christian, um, I was challenged to memorize this book. And I want to tell you, it was one of the most difficult things I did in my young Christian life, is to memorize this book in the King James. Of course, we're working with the new King James this morning, all right? So, I have to read it. Thank you. Hebrews 10, verse 32. But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Great section. Very practical session. Section Takes up present life and the troubles we have in it. And it looks ahead to the coming of the Lord Jesus and to the inheritance that we have in heaven. Let's go back to verse 32. But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. Now, these folk that he's writing to, and we don't really know who's writing the book of Hebrews, um, this section about them joining with this one who is writing, uh, joining with him in his time of great need when he was in prison. Of course, could have applied to several. We know of Peter being in prison for the Lord. Um, I don't think really there's anybody that suggests Peter wrote Hebrews, though, especially knowing how he writes. <laughs> and how he thinks and how he would express himself. It's just not Peter at all. 
And so that has never been a serious offering. We know of John's um, time on the Isle of Patmos. But Paul comes to mind as one we know the most about who endured prison, went through uh, different times of imprisonment and had great need and was supplied much by the saints during those times of imprisonment. But you have to remember, too, the New Testament doesn't give us a full record of all that went on in the early church. It's just God's selections in his omniscience, you know, and in his divine wisdom, he gave us what he gave us. He gave it to us by revelation. He gave it to us by the work of the Holy Spirit, working through men, inspiring them to write the words of Scripture, guarding them from error. But there could have been other people besides those we know of in the New Testament who were in prison. And so some other names have been offered. Apollos is one that often comes to mind. Barnabas, even, I've heard. Different ones. But uh, the writer definitely understood, if you could say that, the Jewish experience. He understood the Jewish religion. He understood the Old Testament. And by God's aiding him, this revelation is given to us through him, would seem to us he was a Jew. Uh, it would seem to us that these great and powerful truths are directed to Jewish Christians who have as much an understanding of the Old Testament as the writer. Now, if you've known the Lord for a while, and if you've read and studied the Old Testament, you can step into the richness of these teachings with us. If you're a brand new Christian and haven't been exposed much to the teachings of the Old Testament, you might find them a little more difficult to handle. Don't have those roots down. My, how rich it was to be born again with a background of knowledge. Now, a lot of you folk found that out. I know we have so many folk in our church who are former Roman Catholics. And uh, you, you thank the Lord that in his grace, you came to the place where you fully trusted in his work at the cross for your salvation. Trusted him, repenting of your sin didn't trust in your works anymore. But in fact, having that background may have aided you greatly in your Christian walk and your approach to the Word of God. It could have caused a great many hindrances for you as well because of the things you were taught. But it still may have given you quite a backlog of, of information from the Scriptures. Unfortunately, a lot of times our religious background gives us a a lot of information that didn't come from the scriptures. And uh, sometimes it gets all mixed up in our heads. I have often lamented that when I came to the Lord, I was ignorant of the scriptures. I told you before, I didn't know where Genesis was. <laughs> I, I, it would have probably taken me a few minutes to find it. Actually, I didn't know if that was the name of a man or uh, a theological thought, or, or what it was, the idea that it was a section of the Scripture probably wouldn't have come into my mind. I was that ignorant of the Word of God. So I've had to build up from the bottom. And it has been a wonderful experience, building block upon lot, block, stone upon stone, learning the great truths of the Word of God, you know, those stories that we give our children in Sunday school and youth church, those things that we tie in with the Lord Jesus eventually and help them see the picture of, of God's revealing of his love in Christ, uh, it's wonderful for them that when they come to understand salvation, they have the richness of that other information about the Word of God to see how God illustrates and his salvation and teaches us how to walk, the examples he uses in life from the scriptures. 
They're richly blessed. And missionaries, when they go to the foreign field, you know, they have to lay that whole foundation. You just can't come out there and just say, by the way, Jesus died for your sins. And they'll say, who? He did what? <laughs> when was that? And they have no background, no way of getting a hold of divine truth. And so a foundation has to be laid. And missionaries are realizing these days they need to lay that foundation and tell the story of creation and tell the story of God's working with mankind through the ages and trying to reach him and bring him to the end of himself and showing the great sinfulness of the human race and of the individual and finally then declaring that in the grace of God he sent his son and gave us hope that if any would turn from their sin and receive him, they could be saved. Now, those whose hearts have been prepared in that are then prepared to open up and to say, oh, I am a terrible sinner. And if God loved me that much and provided a Savior, I ought to open my life to him. I ought to let him know that I want forgiveness. I better reach out to him and ask him to have mercy on me. And it's wonderful to see these folk from even the most primitive of tribes in all the earth reach out for the same salvation that you can have, having been uh, maybe given these truths in a setting like this with Bibles that you can read, uh, with whole backgrounds. Can't you think of all those torturous days in grade school when you had to do your grammar work? But isn't it wonderful now that you can read? You can use this book and study it and learn its truths. You're going to think Mrs. Smith? huh? You're going to thank her, that, that old lady that used to stand there with that, that stick? You didn't have one of those, huh? My teachers come along and slap that thing down on the desk. Now oh, get busy. <laughs> Never hit me with it, but I thought she was going to. Somehow, those ladies used to know when your mind wasn't on the right subject. And I'd get busy. I thank God all that background was there, but I was ignorant of the scriptures. He says to them, Recall the former days. Let's go back, he says, to the day when you were saved. When you were first enlightened. Do you know how John says it? I don't have to flip up here. I'm just going to do this very quickly. First John 1, when uh, Jesus, when, when, uh, when the Lord uh, gives us uh, this revelation about God being light, it says, this is the message which you have heard from him, 1 John 1, 5 and declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. And the idea there in that form of the verb on cleanses is it goes on cleansing us from all sin. It's a present operation that goes on from the in the present to do a work out through the future. It goes on cleansing us from all sin. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light. But what happened was at a moment in time. I, I think of um, Ephesians chapter 5, isn't it? Surely it is. Verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You were once, I love the power of this. It does not say you were once in the darkness, but it says you were once darkness. You were the darkness. Remember that darkness that came upon Egypt? The plague of darkness. There wasn't any light. No light from the moon. No light from the sun. The scripture says 
It was a darkness that you could feel, like black velvet all around you, no light anywhere. Just made you feel eerie. You were the darkness. And it's speaking spiritually here. You didn't have a little glimmer of light, some spark of divinity in you. You were absolutely darkness. But then the one who is light came along, and he didn't just give you a little spark. He recreated you. How do you recreate darkness? You make it to be light. And that's what he did. He took you and made you to be light. You know what? He's light. He made you to be what he is. What does that mean? Well, one thing it means is uh, what Isaiah says about righteousness. He clothed you with his garments of righteousness. You know, when you talk about your righteousness, you better remember this. It is his righteousness. Your righteousness is his righteousness. If you have any, it is from him. If you have any, it's a gift. You don't have any righteousness in yourself. In yourself, there is no righteousness. Your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You don't have any righteousness in yourself. All of your righteousness is in Christ. Righteousness and light are often spoke of, spoken of together in the Word of God. When you see him on his throne, as the scenes of Scripture tell us, you see effulgence, you see light, brightness, because there's righteousness there. He's given you that as a gift. He has covered you with that. And he says he covers you with it that the shame of your nakedness might not appear. He doesn't want those filthy rags that are filled with holes of rottenness uh, showing off your nakedness. He wants to cover you with robes, glorious robes of his righteousness. Well, when he did, you became light. You became a light. You became alive in him. Now, when that happened, when the light turned on, you see, it says, uh, looking back in Hebrews 10, um, but recall the former days after you were illuminated, it's just like somebody turned the switch on. You were illuminated. And, you know, have you ever seen your lamp get illuminated? You go over, you turn the light on, and the whole thing lights up. You could put it this way, after you lit up, <laughs> there you were sitting there, just a bundle of darkness, and somebody flipped the switch, and you lit up. It was God that turned the switch. It was God who made you to be light. After you were illuminated... You endured a great struggle with sufferings. Now, that, that somehow doesn't seem to go together for some folk. There I was in my misery and sin, came to the end of myself. In despair, I cried out to God, and he saved me, and then I suffered. <laughs> you know, you say, wait a minute, hey, oh, wait, it's supposed to be... You're supposed to go from hurt and pain and desperate need and cry out to God for mercy, and then everything is supposed to get wonderful. Well, it does. Inside. It does. For eternity. He comes to live in you. He brings his life into you. He makes you to be alive. He makes you light. He brings the, sends the Holy Spirit into you to seal you, to live in you. The Father and Son dwell in you, and they will not depart from you. They make their abode with you. You become a child of God. You have the testimony in your spirit that you're alive in God. But you know what? Trials 
Don't stop. But I'm going to tell you something. The cause for the trials changes. The cause for the trials changes. Before you're saved, the cause for the trials is to teach you that you need the Lord, that you're not sufficient in yourself. It's to teach you to stop sinning, to show you that what you're doing is hurting you. All sin is destructive. Sin leads to death. All sin leads to death. And all that you were doing was hurting you. It's like masochism, you know. Every time you sinned, you were hurting yourself. And the hurt got worse and worse and worse and worse. Then you got saved. Now, loving the Lord, finding out what he says to you from his word, applying it in your life, that stuff wasn't going to hurt you anymore. In fact, it would bless you. But lo and behold, troubles came at you, but they didn't come at you because of your sin. Now they started coming at you because of what? Your what? Your growth in what? In the Lord. Instead of coming at you before because of your sin, now it comes at you because of your what? One word, what is it? Your faith? Good? You used to be darkness, now you're light. You used to be sinful, now you are righteous. You used to suffer because of your sins, now you suffer because of your righteousness. Your growth in the Lord displays your righteousness. Yes, it is. Romans 5, sure. And it's a whole lot of other places too, isn't it, John? Yeah. I've been thinking about First Peter because we're having that in Sunday school, and I want to bring that in here if I can this morning. But you can't win for losing in this world, people. When you sin, you suffer. When you do righteousness, guess what happens? You suffer. Right? Isn't that the way it is? If you sin... You suffer. By the way, David looked at the sinning man and he was really upset about it because he saw the sinful man not suffering. He thought, you know, in this world, if you're going to do sin, you ought to suffer for it right now. You ought to have a hard time always. Do all sinners have hard times always? No, they don't. Is it possible that a sinner might have plenty of money and have good health and have four cars and two houses and a summer cottage. And Is it possible that they could have all the gold and diamond that those diamonds they want to hang on their body and eat sumptuously like the man of Luke 16, you know? Remember the beggar Lazarus sitting at his gate begging for some crumbs and there was this man, this rich man who fared sumptuously? See, the Lord Jesus doesn't hide from you that there are many people in this world who are destined for hell that fare sumptuously. But when the man died, where did he go? He went to Hades, the present abode of the ungodly dead. He went to a place of immediate suffering. And what's his ultimate destination? The lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And how long will he be there? How long? Do you believe that, folks? If you believe you'll be there forever, then you obviously don't believe in a purgatory, do you? Nor do I. Because it, it will burn forever and ever with unquenchable fire. But you know, in this life, that man fared sumptuously. So, sometimes our sin hurts us in a way that we can see that it's hurting us. And sometimes our sin hurts us, but we're numb to it. What would God call it being numb to the hurt that you should be feeling, but you're not, while you're sinning? 
You know, he, he speaks of it as a heart condition. Hard-heartedness. He tells Israel about their hard-heartedness. Their insensitivity. You see, the sinner can think that he's not hurting. He can be convinced that he's not hurting because his spirit is insensitive to God. The more the sinner is convinced everything's okay, the more insensitive to God he is. The more he's aware of his hurt and his sinning, the more sensitive to God he is. And if he comes to the place where he just casts himself at the feet of God and is saved, now in the righteousness of God, by the Spirit of God working in him, the world around him will hate him and troubles will come upon him because of his righteousness. Partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations. Let's stop there and say, your troubles are going to be for two reasons. He's just giving you two categories here. Number one, because of you. Because you're going along in your life living righteously and the world is dealing with you because of you. You're a problem to them. You make them feel guilty. You show up their sinfulness. They don't like that. And so they pick at you. They talk against you or they, they may do things against your property or they may hurt your body. They, they just don't like being shown to be sinners. Now, the other side of it is, not just because of you, but because of their hatred and their response to other people, and you have dared to join yourself with those other people. For instance, say there was somebody in our town who was bold in their witness for the Lord Jesus, unashamed of the gospel, and was enduring some great measure of persecution because of it. If you should go to their side and become known as one that would stand with them, guess what might start happening to you? The folks that were attacking them might start attacking you. You have to be careful what church you join yourself with. Be I have to give out warnings. <laughs> because if you join yourself with a church that loves the Lord Jesus and is known for him and is known for his love, then you know you're going to be dealt with with all the rest of those folk. And you know, I, I can only say to you, if you're going to be known for righteousness and for love and you're going to suffer for it, I'm going to say it from Peter's writing in 1 Peter 4, rejoice, be glad. Count it your privilege. If they did it to the Lord Jesus, don't be surprised, they'd do it to you. So you're going to suffer because of your life, and you're going to suffer because of the connection that you have with others that love him. And the world hates righteousness. And whether you know it or not, the world even hates love. They don't even understand what real love is. And it says, For you had compassion on me. So here's how they associated with this one. Paul or whoever else it was that wrote this, for you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. What if you got to be so known as somebody that was associated with another Christian that your own goods were damaged? I know this has been sometimes read, and perhaps so, rightly, to say you were glad to be the one plundering your own goods to give them. But it could also be that others have come in and attacked you and plundered your goods because you dared to associate with one that was known for their godliness. It does happen. Have you taken that joyfully? 
Then it says, therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Your confidence? Don't cast it away. God has a great reward as you look to him. Because he goes on to say, for you have need of endurance so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. You see, great reward and promise. Great reward from verse 35. Promise from verse 36. You see, you have need. Don't cast away your confidence for you have need of endurance. Now in the King James, it says patience. Um, you've heard of the fellow that was seeking the will of God. And his girlfriend's name was Patience. Should I marry her? Oh, he loved her so, he thought. He just needed a sign from God that she was for him. And so he was having his devotions one day in Hebrews 10. And his eyes lit on 36 here, and he says, For you have need of patience. And he said, Oh, that's it. <laughs> God knows my heart. <laughs> this is not a lady. This is uh, the work of God because of your faith. What endurance is, or patience in this case, is, is the response of God to your faith time after time after time after time. See, endurance is kind of stretched over time. So when we say you have need of endurance or need of patience, we mean you have need to go on trusting God moment after moment after moment after moment. You can put them, I, I've often done this like little dots on a line. Faith, 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 faith. And when you do all that, when you have a thousand acts of faith, it, what it's called in Scripture is patience. That's what endurance is constantly in faith going back to God to get what you need to deal with what you're facing. That's what endurance is. Endurance isn't holding on, gritting your teeth, and doing all you can to deal with what you have coming at you in your strength. That is not endurance. Endurance or patience in the Scripture is this constant going to God for what you need to deal with your problems. How do you, how can you put up with the problems you have by constantly going to God for you, whatever you need to go through, whatever you're facing? That's called patience. And you know what you need? This is practical. What you need is patience because this scripture has told you from the day you receive the Lord, walking in righteousness causes trouble from the unbelievers, from the world. From those around you even that may know the Lord, that to still attack you unjustly and wrongly. You have need of patience, which means go back to your Lord and keep looking to him and trusting in him for what you need to go through it, because he gives you a promise. He gives you a promise of great reward. He never really fully explains your reward. He just says, there's a great reward. If you will just let him do what he wants to do through you day by day and hour by hour, he says, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. The one thing your eyes are cast forward to is the soon appearing of the Lord Jesus. He will come. And in view of the fact that he will come, he's saying he does not lie. How long do I have to endure the problems of this life? It seems like forever, Lord. Oh, no, he says. I'm coming. I haven't told you a lie. I really am coming. And in view of the fact that I'm coming, I want you to go on trusting me as you deal with your burdens and hurts, troubles and sufferings, you keep calling on me for my grace, for my supply. You keep letting me do all that I'd like to do through you. By your dependence on me, I'm glorified. So you keep depending on me and let me keep working in you till the day I come. 
because I'm glorified. It honors me when you trust in me. I'm glorified in that. It brings great glory to me to be able to say, to show that when there was need, I gave supply to you according to your faith. It gives me the privilege of showing my love and provision when you cry out to me. And when I get to show it, he's saying, that proves my character, my faithfulness to my word. So it is the will of God that we suffer. It is the will of God that we look to him because he is coming. And that's how he uses the promise of his coming as a very practical encouragement for us to go on believing him for whatever we have to go through. Now the just shall live by faith. And it means being justified as one that is justified, those that know Christ, those that have been pronounced righteous, that's what justification is, and God is the one that does the pronouncing. Those that God has declared to be absolutely righteous, those that God has said are clothed with his righteousness, they're supposed to live how? By faith. They come into that life by faith, and they're supposed to walk on in faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. And some have said, now there, you see, you could draw back and you could lose it. The writer is quick to add this, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition. We are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. The drawing back here means that they draw back and never believe. Never once do they put their trust in Christ. Never once do they get born again. Because he can say with confidence of these, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition. He's writing to people who he knows. Once they have put their faith in him, you see, now the just shall live by faith, they have come into that faith. He wants them also to exercise that faith. Not only does he does the appeal of Scripture say to you, please trust in Jesus as your Savior, the Word of God also says to you, why don't you walk in it? Walk by faith. The walk by faith means step by step by step by step by step. It's saying the same thing that patience is. Step by step you have trouble and you need to go to God step by step. And if you'll believe him, you'll have the proof of God's grace, but with a hope. And the hope is he's true to his word. He is returning soon. 2,000 years doesn't seem like soon, does it? Believe me, there's nobody alive, really, that really wants to die quickly, is there? If people get to the place where they want to die, then life has lost its meaning. They're really without hope for the future. They don't have any answers left. Man clings to life because it's all he has, especially when he doesn't know anything about the future, has no hope for the future. But when you uh, have a hope, and then you say, well, I'd rather go and be with the Lord Jesus. Now, that sounds like craziness to this world. But you know what he says to us as Christians? You can live with hope. You have this, the future secure in me because you're kept by the power of God. But I want your faith day by day trusting in me because I've given you the promise that I will come. Your future rests on his truthfulness to his word. Well, with that, if he's truthful, then you can go to him with all your burdens and problems. He does not lie. And he'll bring you through these difficulties. The Lord Jesus will return. It's his promise. Father, thank you for this assurance from the Word. Thank you for the Lord Jesus soon coming. We do have need of patience. 
to walk by faith and not by sight. To let Christ be the source of our very strength, the one who has made us to be light, Lord, that his light might shine out through us. Thank you that we can identify ourselves with those that believe and take what comes because you give us the grace of God to live it. The inner man knows the joy that the outer part of us, the body, may not be able to show just yet. But Jesus is coming. We wait for his soon appearance in his name. Wow, so there we have it. Another message from the Word of God. Thank you, Pastor Rains, for bringing such a great message to us, even though it was recorded back in 1992. Still, very good message. And if you liked it, well, come back. We'll have more. In fact, next week, um, I don't know if it's a continuation or if it's going to be a new message, but it's kind of on the same subject. It'd be about the... Uh, the return of, of Christ, the imminent return of Christ. So that'll be a good one. So you have to come back next week to hear that one. And let's see, what else? Oh, uh, yeah, the postcards. I wanted to mention that. If you want postcards, uh, we have some. We could mail them out to you. You could either, like, just have one, or you could get a bunch and send them out to your friends or maybe put them on your literature table in your church. So if you want to do that, you just have to go to the website, which is www.legacybiblepodcast.com. And you go on the bottom there, there's a little comment form there. You just uh, tell us what you want, you put in your address, and we'll be more than happy to send those out to you. So you can do that. Also, subscribe, follow, you know, I always say that if you're interested in the uh, a video version of, of the podcast. We are on YouTube, although it is exactly the same as what you get here, but it's just another outlet. You can go there and subscribe if you'd like. So it really helps out you, if you subscribe. Okay, then. I'm glad you were here. I'm glad I could bring these to you. So with that being said, I'll say goodbye for next, for not till next week. And until then, have a great day and have a great week and I'll see you next time. So long.